In this section, we're going to review how the visual system perceives movement. Now, movement is obviously an important aspect of the environment that your visual system has to perceive if you're to, you know, act on objects that are moving in it. Here in the first display, though, we see an interesting illusion in which if you look at this, if you look at it straight on and make sure you expand the presentations to its largest size. You may not be able to see the effect if it's too small. Expand this image to as large a size you can on the screen. If you look straight at it, straight at the center, you will see movement induced in the peripheral parts of your visual fields. You won't see movement in the central part, but as you look square in the center of it, you'll notice that around the outsides, those circles look like they're moving. They look like they're spinning. But of course, nothing is actually spinning. Things are still, you know, they're still here. There's nothing actually moving. Uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon that has yet to be adequately explained. It obviously involves your peripheral vision and not your central. And somehow when the rods are perceiving these circles uh, and movement's induced, and movement perception is induced, probably because of their shape, the, the way they're kind of could be inferred as sort of spiraling, and the contrast, the, the color there and the um, dark part, somehow that's related to the, uh, there's a theory that relates that contrast to the induced movement. So once you see something spiraling like that and you see a color contrast like this, you, your brain infers that the object is spinning, that it's moving. The next thing I'd like you to do is to look at a movie at the course website called fMRI Movement SM for small, in which it will show you uh, activations of the brain associated with movement or just visual perception. You can see part of it here. Uh, on the right side, a flashing checkerboard is presented. On the left side, those dots are perceived as moving towards you, like stars, you know. And you can see in the bottom on the left that other parts of the brain are active when there's movement present. And these are very classic centers of the brain. These are the movement centers in each hemisphere. And when your brain constructs movement or perceives movement, these areas become very active. The part on the right just shows a flashing checkerboard that's not perceived as moving. And so there you just see the primary visual cortex being active. You might wonder what you need to perceive in order for something to be constructed as moving. Because all that's really happening on your visual, in your visual system, on your retina, is that receptor areas are just changing in terms of the light levels and the frequencies that it's being exposed to. All your eyes know is that there's just a change in the pattern of light across the retina. Your brain takes those patterns, presumably forms an object out of certain ones from the contours, and then draws an inference in a sense or a deduction that that object is moving across the field. Now you can imagine that takes quite a bit of processing power to figure that out because all the information your brain gets is just the changes in light levels and frequencies on that field of the retina. Now we see all kinds of things as moving. We can of course present stimuli to subjects that are false and they'll perceive them as moving and all kinds of funny things happen when you perceive movement. Most of the time, however, most movement occurs in a time frame that you can perceive and handle. But if you think about simple things like watching uh, a movie in which there's we a wheel is moving, and you'll notice that sometimes the wheel appears moving backward. You know, and things like that happen because the frame rates of the movies are um, not at a certain level, and so they're not capturing the movement of the actual wheels. Well, at any rate, the, the general phenomenon that occurs is that you, you have a, a um, processor that is detecting the change in the forms as the form moving. Now, I'd like you to go back to the MTV Fish movie and take a look at that, because obviously there, see, an artist has actually created those forms, has actually created those objects, and when he moves those objects across the a screen, a computer screen, the computer creates frames of animation that you then put together as smooth movement of these objects. Actually, in this movie, the objects aren't really moving all that smooth, if you think about it. The fish looks kind of jerky, you know, as it goes through. Obviously, the artist could have made it look much more natural. But you have a, a processor that takes those forms and, and basically compiles them into the movement of a fish as opposed to just a green color 
you know, the green color of the fish uh, changing on your retinal space. You definitely perceive that as a fish moving and not just as a change in the uh, luminance or the color of green, you know, moving across your fields. Uh, this is referred to as stroboscopic movement, and this is the basis for all movement perception in films and in animations. You do not perceive these individual frames of a film or an animation as individual frames sort of put together into, you know, a movie. You perceive this as objects moving in an environment, in a, in a, in a three-dimensional space that your brain has constructed from seeing the images. And we'll get to more of that on subsequent slides. But right now, just look at the, the stroboscopic movement in that uh, fish movie. Of course, you can take the fish movie and stop it and advance it frame by frame. So you can see what individual frames look like and uh, see then when you run it continuously how you've taken those frames and blended them together into an object moving in a three-dimensional space. Okay, what's the time frame for perceiving movement? Obviously, the, an object has to be changing its position by some sort of time factor for your brain to construct that it's moving. Now, it turns out that this time factor is quite short. So if it's, and obviously if it gets, uh, the move, if the time gets too long, when there's a change in the object position, you don't see them as moving. You see them as in one place and then another place. You don't have this illusion of movement from place to place. Well, if you look at, uh, a, say, an, a, an object or a light source, and here are the time frames here on this slide, if, it's, if it changes in less than 30 milliseconds, then you perceive it as simultaneous. You don't perceive there's any movement. So you would see two light sources there independently existing, not as if they moved. Because the difference in time between when one appears and the other appears is so short. Your brain can't process things that fast, and so you perceive the two light sources as being independent. At about 30 to 60 milliseconds, you begin to see partial movements as if the one light source is moving, say, from the left to the right. So if the, what, if the left one comes on first and then the right one, and the difference in time is about 30 to 60 milliseconds, you will begin to perceive those two light sources as if one on the left is moving toward the right. At about 60 milliseconds, which is very small, see 60 milliseconds is six-tenths of a second, you will see illusory movement. You will, see, you, will, you will perceive the light sources, those two circles. If one appears on the left and then 60 milliseconds later the other appears, you will put them together as the left one moving toward the right. Above uh, 200 to 300 milliseconds, you don't see them as moving. As a single source moving, you see them as two independent uh, light sources appearing sequentially, but not as one moving. So that's a very interesting phenomenon. So things that are uh, appear to be continuous, light sources, and again, your retina, what your brain is getting is just a pattern of light sources. As light sources move across the retina of a certain speed, we perceive those light sources as moving across the retina. If it's if it appears and there then a light source appears 200, 200 milliseconds later. We don't, your brain does not construct that as movement. It constructs it as two successive different light sources appearing and then disappearing and so on. It does not see them as moving. Now that's very interesting because probably most objects in the world uh, change their, their um, form on the retina at about the speed of, you know, 60 milliseconds or so. And if they do that, you perceive that object is moving, not as two independent ones appearing and disappearing. Okay, here's a brief description of the phenomenon of induced movement. And uh, if you've ever been in a train, or sometimes in a car, I've noticed this happens, but frequently in trains, I think because in trains, the entire visual environment is sort of encapsulated by the train. Now, for people that don't live in the Northeast, they probably don't ride trains that much. Here in the Northeast, though, riding a train or a subway is so common that this, you'll have this experience if you ride a subway uh, or a train that, that other people may not have that, that often. If you're sitting in a train and the, another train moves by you, sometimes it will feel like all of a sudden you started to move and you'll react as if the, your train is moving when actually it's the other one that's moving 
And this relative contrast, this relative comparison of one train to the other leads to an induced movement in your train. And the other train will appear stationary, even though it's obviously moving by. I find that that occurs whenever my visual environment is completely encapsulated, though. If I have other frames of reference, they're inconsistent with my train moving. Like if I can see out the other window of the train, and clearly the station is still there, and I haven't moved, I won't have that experience. It's only when I've sort of isolated my visual experience to the other moving train that I get induced movement in my system. Now, this is your brain interpreting the world as, okay, that train is stationary, you're moving. And it can make mistakes like that, and you'll react as if you're actually moving when you're not. Usually I find the phenomenon is very short-lived. If my, if my train isn't actually moving, I don't get the other cues. And the other cues are things like the change in my center of gravity, you know, the momentum changing uh, when I'm moving and so on. There's uh, obviously forces that act on you when your train is actually moving that aren't there. And then when a few, within a few seconds or a minute or so, the induced movement illusion is gone. Well, this relative motion is referred to as vection. So if the relative motion in a stationary object is referred to as, to, referred to as vection, it's a very sort of simple concept that the relative motion produces a vector, a force, a perceived force in a stationary object that's not actually there. Now we have movement after images or after effects, just like you'll learn about later with color after effects. Presumably what happens is the neurons, the system involved in perceiving movement, if movement is in one direction, uh, gets, oh, they, they become, in a sense, saturated or overactive. They, they become fatigued by, by processing movement in that direction, or somehow they become, your system becomes primed because of, this, of a very systematic movement in one way. And you'll have an after image that's the opposite direction. Now, to experience this is very easy. It's, it's also referred to as the water, waterfall effect. Because imagine if you're watching a waterfall and it's falling in one direction. If you watch that waterfall and then we and for a long time and then change your attention to some other display, you'll perceive the objects as if they're going backwards from the waterfall direction. Okay, to experience this here, go to the website, the course website, and watch a movie, movie called uh, Movement... Uh, sm.mov, and watch it and look at the very center, look at that dot in the center the whole time and keep your attention there while it's playing. And then uh, observe what happens when the movie stops. And you can do this over and over again. It always works. But be careful. Watch what happens when the movie stops. And you'll have a perfect depiction of the movement after image effect. Okay, you may recall from watching one of the other movies that one of the major findings in the study of vision was the discovery that certain cells in the nervous system respond to the orientation of certain lines in space. Remember the movie about the cats? It's when a bar, a line was shown to them of, of a different orientation that the cells and the visual cortex would fire when that line was that orientation? It suggests that what the nervous system is doing is breaking down of the visual array in the in the retinal display into sets of lines, sets of contours, and builds forms from that. Well, here you see a graphic displaying the um, when a bar is a certain orientation, a bar of light across the visual field is a certain orientation, a certain number of degrees, a certain angle. Then there's a cell that fires at a very high rate, and when the orientation of the bar is somewhere else, it fires at a much lower rate. Well, presumably there are other cells that are firing at those other orientations, and from that you build a model of how that object exists in the environment. Now you can tell from how it's expressed it that there's still a lot to be known about this. It's clear that cells are responding to certain orientations of lines, but that's about it. How you actually construct a three-dimensional representation of an object by its contours is still unknown. But these uh, this ability to recognize contours and orientations of lines is going to help you build a model of how those lines and how those objects move in the environment. So this is the first step to presenting that. The next slide will show you what happens when objects actually move in the environment. Here's how a relatively simple network of cells, feature detecting cells, might actually work to detect motion 
Remember, there, there's a bunch of cells detecting, say, the orientation of a 45-degree line in space. And imagine these are the cells doing that. But to perceive that that 45-degree line is moving across space, you need to have some network of cells that perceive that line and then perceive it changing. We well, this very simple network that responds to movement from right to left, but not from left to right. So you've got a set of um, neurons here. M is the movement-detecting cell. Then the others are the feature-detecting cells. If you see a perpendicular line there, that means inhibition. So if you look at, say, movement from right to left, so the right side would be starting with F, E, D, like that, you'll see that the F receptor is going to be, or the F cell is going to be excited first, then E, but E is now inhibitory. However, F did get excited. Then as the light passes to D, it gets excited, but as it goes to C, C inhibits D. Now, if I go from left to right, I immediately inhibit all the cells. So A inhibits B, C inhibits D, E inhibits F, and so M never gets stimulated. So this is a, a way in which a network might be constructed to detect movement in one direction. Here's a slide that refers to a study in which monkeys were trained to detect movement. And when movements were correlated, when they had a pattern of dots there in which the movements were the same, there were higher firing rates in the, in the, in the medial temporal dorsal stream when this occurred than when the dots were not correlated. So if they were partially correlated or not correlated at all, there wasn't a firing rate anywhere near as high as when they were correlated. Now this is a reference to the wear system, the dorsal stream in the parietal, you know, the occipital parietal area, part of the part of the brain that detects where things are. That makes sense because this has to do with where objects are moving. But when objects are moving in a correlated fashion, so you had a set of dots moving together, you got a different response in the neuron than when they were not correlated in their movement. So the brain is responding to movements. As movements are correlated with each other, objects are moving together, perhaps lines are moving together, your brain is formulating a, a model of an object moving in a three-dimensional space, which is what you generally perceive. Okay, now we have something to build on here for movement detection. We have corollary discharge theory. Now, corollary discharge theory is a pretty fancy name for something that just refers to incorporating your eye movements into your perception of movement. Now, you've got to think about this, and think about it in a very general sense. Uh, there's a lot of special terms in this theory and acronyms and stuff that are really just um, making it too complicated, more complicated than it deserves to be. But what happens is you, you have, imagine you have a situation in which you're, you're outside and you're watching a bird flying across your visual field. Well, you look at the bird, and your eyes move with the bird. So your eyes are going to track the bird. Now, if you think about the image that's on your retina, since your eyes are tracking the bird, your image on your retina does not move. Okay, so it stays in the same place, because you're actually moving your eyes consistent with the bird's movement. Now, if all you were using was the retinal image to make an inference about movement, you wouldn't have any information. It would look like the bird was stationary because the retinal image didn't change. Now, because of that, there's a theory that proposes, well, your eye movements factor into the perception of a movement of an object, which is a very interesting idea. I mean, obviously, it has, something like that has to happen. Otherwise, you, would have, you wouldn't be perceiving tracked objects as moving objects, which clearly we do. As we track them with our eyes, we have a very clear idea that they're moving. Okay, well, how might this work? And here you see some graphics that refer to it. And let's look at the graphic on the right side. Here you've got your eyes. Now the key would be feedback from your eye muscles. As your eye, as your eye moves, obviously your eye muscles have to contract and relax. And that movement of your muscles is perceived by, your, by a system in your muscles. All your muscles, when they move, your brain knows that they're moving because you have a pro thing called a proprioceptive receiver, proprioceptive receptors in your muscles, and that information could be monitored by your brain. And that's what this theory proposes. You basically have a, a system that monitors the retinal image, and you have a system that monitors your eye movements via your muscles, and you compare them. 
And so when your eyes are moving, when your eye muscles are contracting, and the retinal image stays the same, your brain will make an inference that the object is moving and that you're tracking it. And so when it formulates that object's movement in three-dimensional space, which is the basis for your perception, you do perceive it as moving, even though the retinal image has, has stayed the same. Now, if your eyes are not moving, suppose your eye muscles are not contracting, and the object is sitting there on the retina, but your eye muscles are not moving, you will make an inference that the object is stationary in space. So imagine you're looking up outside and you're looking at the moon. Well, the moon doesn't, well, actually the moon does move, doesn't it? But it doesn't move that fast. So you're, you're looking at the moon. The retinal image will say the moon is stationary for the brief time you're looking at it. It's, it the image on your retina stays put. Your eye muscles don't move. And so you make an inference that the moon is not moving. But it's up there in space in your visual fields and you're not tra you're not uh, moving your eyes to track it, and so therefore it's not moving. It's a stationary object up there. Well, that's all this theory proposes. Now, there are a lot of interesting sort of corollaries that are to it that uh, sort of results of well, what if you artificially make your eye not move, and uh, you your retinal image, you know, if your eye doesn't move and your retinal image uh, stays the same, uh, and when you artificially have have made your eye not move, you know, what do you perceive? You know, things like that. And we'll get to a set of those in the next slide. But always keep in mind that what this is about is integrating eye movements with the retinal image movement in the way in which you put those together to form a proper inference about movement of objects actually in space. Okay, well, here are some of these permutations of uh, combinations of inferences you can derive from the corollary discharge theory. Now, remember, this involves the motor signals that have to do with eye movements being correlated with the image movement across the retina to produce a perception of movement or perception of the object is stationary. Well, here's this take case one here. Um, here we're going to perceive movement without movement on the retina. Okay, the first of these, imagine if you move your eyes while viewing an after image in the dark. Now, an after image is an afterimage on your eye is produced by the receptors being overactive while they were perceiving the image. And the reciprocal action of that is to produce an afterimage on your, in your perception. Now, you've probably all seen these. I mean, it's very easy to produce this. If you just look at a light source, very briefly, don't look at, it, don't look at it as, you know, a light bulb for a long time. Look at a light source that's relatively bright for a very brief time, then close your eyes, and you will see all these kinds of afterimages associated with the light. Now imagine if you went, you looked at a light, and you turned it off, and then you looked at the afterimage in the dark. Okay, well the afterimage, it moves with the retina. Okay, so you'll perceive it moving with the ret you'll perceive it moving as you move your eyes around without movement in the retina. Okay, because see an afterimage always stays in the same place on the retina. It obviously doesn't move. So you'll perceive it moving though if you move your eyes around. You'll perceive it moving as if it was an object in the environment that's actually moving around. Okay, another one of these is to push on your eyeball while looking at a stationary location. Don't ever do this. But if you did this, if you made your eye artificially move, you'll get a your brain will get obviously information that your eyeball moved. You'll get this corollary discharge without the movement on the retina, and it will appear as if the scene is moving. But don't ever do this. Yeah, that does happen. There have been research studies done like this. Actually, I believe Isaac Newton even did this back when he was studying optics. He did something like this to show um, the way in which perception changes with movement. But don't ever do this. You can obviously damage your eye. Now, the other thing you do is if you... Um, now, this that's another example of, of getting perception of movement when there's no movement of an object on the retina. Okay, a third example is if you follow a moving object with your eyes... Okay, the movement on the retina doesn't change. This is like the examples that I decided before. The movement on your retina doesn't change because you're tracking it with your eyes. So there you get the correlated discharge signal without the uh, movement on the retina. 
the IMS, and the object appears to be moving. That's because your brain puts those two things together. Well, the eyes are moving, but the object is staying stationary on the retina. The person must be tracking this object in space. It's moving consistent with the speed at which the eyes are moving. And so that's how it gets mapped into three-dimensional space in your perception. The other thing you could do is to paralyze your eye muscles and then try to move your eyes. When you try to move your eyes, you generate a signal that's presumably picked up uh, by the system that your eyes are moving because you're trying to move your eyes. And presumably that's, theoretically anyway, that's a piece of information that's used to construct the notion that your eyes are moving. Now here you get the corollary discharge without the retinal movement because, remember, your eyes are paralyzed. In this case, the whole scene appears to move. So the whole background, foreground appears to move. Now, you obviously can never do this. I thought it would always be interesting to try this sometime with people that are artificially paralyzed for medical purposes. There are drugs that paralyze you uh, for medical procedures, and I always thought it would be interesting if, if, if I could run into a patient who had been paralyzed to ask them to try to do this to see if that actually happens. See, I believe that correlated discharge theory is mediated through proprioceptive feedback from your eyes. So your intention to move your eyes, I don't, I don't believe, produces the corollary discharge signal that's integrated with the retinal movement signal. I think the signal comes from your eyes that they've actually moved, and that proprioceptive sensation is then incorporated with vision. The reason I think that is because uh, sensory systems like proprioception, you know, the sense that your muscle has moved, is better integrated with other sensory systems in the parietal lobe than motor intentions, which are in the frontal lobes. But I could be disproved about this, and I've never investigated enough to figure it out myself. I think it would be very interesting, though, to take some patients that are paralyzed in the trauma center and, just, and to ask them to try to do this. Uh, it would obviously not be in their interest, you know, medically. It would just be an experiment, but it might distract them a little bit from the things that have happened to them that got them paralyzed in the first place. Uh, drugs are used to paralyze people in trauma centers because they're thrashing around and they're, you know, they're trying to pull out all their tubes and stuff, and they're obviously in a delirious state until so they get paralyzed to stop all that. It must be a very unnerving experience because you're put on a respirator because obviously you can't breathe and things. There are also other natural occurring situations, uh, in particular, some snakes have a venom that will paralyze you, and the way in which the drugs were discovered was because um, and it, somebody, I don't remember who, got paralyzed by the poison of um, poison dart frogs in South America. And he was poisoned by a um, uh, the, the Indians. He was attacked in some way and was poisoned by them and became paralyzed. I must, but he was alert and awake. And it must be a very, very strange experience to be physically paralyzed, to not be able to move a muscle, even though you can see and hear everything around you. But Curari was discovered that way uh, by accident. Then he figured out from the natives what they were using for their poisons and then developed Curari, which became the basis for the paralyzing drugs that are used today. At any rate, when you paralyze your eye, mu eye muscles and try to move your eyes, the theory is that that trying produces a signal that's incorporated by the visual system into a perception that the eye has moved. And so if the eye moves, that means you're tracking the object, and it resolves this by making the whole scene move. Because, see, the stationary, the image on your retina doesn't change, even though you, it, your brain has this information that your eye moved. Well, if your eye moves, the, you know, the, the retina should change. And so what your brain says is, okay, the world moved. The whole scene moves. And I'd love to do a research study to try to figure that one out. In our spatial mapping of the world, especially our, our body in orientation to the world, we have a very strong predilection to seeing foreground objects moving against backgrounds. Now, this is, harkens back to the Gestalt psychology material in which foreground and background are in strong contrast. Now, that's how the world is. I mean, obviously, there are objects in front of other objects. There tends to be an environment out there in which you have a background. Then you have objects in front moving around in the back against the background and the background stays uh, stationary remains unmoving
So we have a strong predilection to making objects move in the foreground in contrast to stationary backgrounds. Now if we drive by, suppose this guy in the picture here wasn't moving, suppose he was just standing there, and we drove by in a car, if we're moving, we formulate the model that those objects in the foreground and the background are all stationary, and that you're moving, that the observer is moving. So we have the foreground object stationary, the background is stationary, and if I'm obviously moving past it, looking at it, I'll formulate the idea that I'm moving and those objects are stationary. Uh, sometimes, even if they're, if they're moving with us, if they move along with us at the same speed, we'll formulate an idea that they're actually still when actually they're moving. And you really have to keep you know, taxing your spatial system to make sure to keep them moving along with you if you're moving the same. Uh, there's a strong tendency to take relative motion if it's the same as if it's stationary, as if everyone's stationary and the other objects are moving. We don't do that too much. Induced motion is a good example of that. That's the motion when the train is moving next to you and you think you're, you're actually moving and that other train is stationary. Well, it just goes to show you how the higher order processing of visual information leads to a spatial arrangement of objects, and it can be fooled every once in a while. It actually can be fooled, I think, a lot. It just most of the time in the environment, things are usually are configured the way we expect them to be, and we see foreground objects moving against stationary backgrounds. Now we're going to explore this in more, de in more detail. This represents a higher level processing of, of visual information to form a spatial model of the world that you use to make perceptions about where objects are moving in relative to stationary backgrounds. This is a good example of how form perception influences the perception of movement. In this example, you're going to see where the form of the bird, once it's identified as such, will and it moves, will reinforce its shape in its, in its relationship to the background. This is actually very similar to the Dalmatian movie I showed you before in which form was established by movement. And here we have a very similar thing, where movement is going to establish form, and form will establish movement. And the, these things help us understand, okay, we have a spatial array here, in which we have a foreground object moving against a stationary background. That enables us to perceive that movement much more accurately than if we didn't have a spatial mo uh, model like this. Okay, go, so go to the course website, run a movie called birdmovie.mov, and you'll see this effect very clearly. Now we're going to deal with a phenomenon called biological movement. Now this is not something that's that novel or that different from what I've presented before. It's referred to biological motion because it deals with naturally occurring motion of biological objects. Uh, and usually what it's referring to is the, ob is the motion of people uh, walking. That's all they're really referring to. And what happens is we form a model, especially of other objects moving that are similar to us. We obviously form a model also of our own biological motion because we're obviously going to be walking through the environment. But we identify aspects of motion involved with different kinds of objects. And these can be very, very subtle. Uh, the human nervous system has a great capacity for depicting spatial order and since we watch people move so much, we have formulated some pretty interesting models of how they move and what it means. To see this, go to a website that I've indicated here. I've been unable to download the movies associated with this website, so you just have to go to the website. It's a fascinating depiction using a uh, Java applet on the website of different kinds of biological motion. Motion associated with men versus women, versus motion associated with a heavy person versus a light person, motion associated with an anxious person versus a calm person. At any rate, just go to the website. There are, little, there are little sliders at the website in which you can change the attributes of the motion, and you'll be amazed at how it does represent what you think of as nervous motion or uh, male, male movement versus female movement. And you will, you will recognize, I think, immediately that you were unaware of this that you never really thought about, well, how do females really move that differently than males? They have a very different motion uh, when they walk than males do. And you, since you probably never sat down and analyzed it, you didn't recognize what your sensory system was doing all along, formulating spatial models that help you recognize these objects as they move. And this graphic displays a very interesting relationship between the direction of biological motion, 
and the firing of neurons that are responding to the direction of movement. So the dots up there are moving in a certain way. They're moving in a certain direction. Now, if you were just to see a pattern of dots, I don't think you'd you know recognize they're moving a certain direction or indicating the biological motion is in a certain direction. Your brain notices this, though. Your brain has developed a model of how a human body moves. When it moves one way, neurons, certain neurons fire. When it moves another way, they don't fire. And presumably when they move the other way, other neurons fire. This is very similar to the phenomenon where they were measuring the firing of neurons in the occipital lobe when the cats were looking at different lines moving across space in certain directions. That movement in a certain direction is perceived by the brain and organized as a perception of that object moving in that direction. Since it's very important for us to figure out where contours are going, where contours are moving, we have very sophisticated models for dealing with that. Obviously, if you know where, where an object is moving, you can operate on it. You can manipulate it. If you need to catch something that's moving, you are able to do that. I mean, imagine the skill of humans when they're hunting, you know, with a bow and arrow or something, or a spear. So that object moving in visual space, you're now going to orient to it with your body in a way that enables you to throw a spear at it and, you know, presumably hit it right where you want to in order to kill your prey. Uh, we don't do that much in the modern world, but if you think about playing tennis, it's not actually that different. In order to hit a tennis ball, you have to orient in space to that ball coming to you, and it's moving in a certain way. It becomes a, a spatial, big, important spatial problem to fix in order for you to orient your body in space and hit the ball back with the right orientation to be a successful player. Another thing that we do is generate structure from motion. When objects are moving in the world, we tend to form spatial models of them that give us a lot of cues about how they're shaped. And here I'm just not going to here I'm not going to tell you about it so much as show you with an example. I think when you see this example, you'll immediately recognize the phenomenon. It depicts this movie depicts a cube spinning in space. Actually, I believe in a previous presentation I showed it to you as an example of how movement affects um, perception. But here you'll notice that when the cube moves, and it's a ray tracing of the cube, a line drawing of the cube, when the cube moves, you clearly you see it much more clearly as a three-dimensional object. When it's just stationary sitting there on the screen, you don't have a sense of its three-dimensional shape so much. But when it moves in that three-dimensional space, presumably consistent with it, your brain then formulates a three-dimensional model of the object, and you perceive it as a full three-dimensional cube. So go to the course website and play a movie called Spin Cube. Here we have an example where once we form a contour, a shape, we tend to want to have uh, elements of the background, elements of the foreground conform to that shape. This example is a reasonably good movie depiction of this. I, I've been able to see this effect every time I watch the movie, but sometimes it's hard to see. I'm not sure it's the best designed movie for this. But what happens is when that circle moves across the screen, we tend to capture dots in the background as part of the circle. Since we see the circle as having such great integrity as a form, we tend to want to give it a texture, we tend to want to give it a surface, give it its integrity as an object. And so our nervous system grabs some random dots in the background and places them as part of the circle. And you sh when you watch this movie, you, sh you should be able to see that parts of the background appear in the circle as if they're part of the circle, as if they're traveling with it. And I think I can see this, you know, I can sort of tell that there are dots that are sort of traveling on the inside, traveling with the circle. It doesn't look like it's just a circle that's transparent, traveling over random dots. Now, the background has to be random because if it has any kind of internal structure, any sort of shape to it, you won't do this. You will not make the background part of the circle if the background looks like it has integrity and looks like it's far away from the object. So go to the course website, play dot movie, and see if you can see some of the dots in the center traveling with the circle. Now I have a movie that depicts a constraint on movement that's associated with models you have of how objects should move. And this is a, also illustrated in your book. It's a constraint on movement that's caused by your perception of how a hand and a head and a face should interact with each other. Uh, one, you need to go to the course website and play a movie called Fist Move Slow and then another one called Fist Move Fast. 
Now, when you play the movie called Fist Moved Slow, when she, it's the same frame. The, both movies are the same except the speed. The speed is different. Now, what's going to happen is her fist, her hand, is going to be behind her head and then move to the front of her head, the front of her face there like you see in the slide. Now, if it's done slowly, if the frame rate is slow, you will perceive the hand as if it's moving around her head. So you, as you would sort of naturally make a movement like that. Sort of like your brain says, well, if you have time, you know, these objects are going to move this way. If you play it fast, however, you'll perceive that as the hand, her hand moving through her head. Because it's done so quickly, your brain can't make any sense out of it except to make her hand move through her head. Now, both movies are the same. There's no difference between the movies except the speed. But what your brain does, it tries to accommodate to the speed and make sense out of the imagery that it's seeing and so it makes your perception match the conventional ideas of how a hand should move around a face. But if it's too fast, it says, well, it must have moved through the face somehow, and it produces a kind of optic illusion as if her hand has moved through her head. Uh, these, this, of course, is not a naturally occurring image, and so it's, an, again, another attempt by your brain to try to figure out these you know, artificial stimuli that it's given by psychologists. Ordinarily, of course, she could never move her hand through her head, that would be um, pretty bizarre. But your brain has to do that to make sense out of the speed. So see how that um, model constrains how you perceive movement. Finally, I have a movie of a woman who sustained strokes in both hemispheres involving the motion areas that you saw depicted in the fMRI movie at the very beginning of this presentation. She has an inability, presumably, to perceive motion. Now, unfortunately, the movie doesn't depict this very well. I'm not sure how you would, but I would have really thought about how to how to figure out how I'm going to test how she's going to perceive motion. Uh, they show her doing things that are largely spatial that would involve motion detection, but because they're so complex, it looks like it might also involve other spatial processing areas that are also involved in her strokes. It's very, very unusual to have strokes involving two hemispheres. This must have happened over the course of time. It's a very rare event to have strokes involve two hemisphere, hemispheres and, of course, have the person survive. Uh, most of the great cases of this uh, syndrome have involved people that somehow had uh, traumatic injuries to their brain, uh, in particular in wartime is when it was first discovered when soldiers would be shot in a funny way, a strange way, they would clip the back of their head and go through both hemispheres, sort of going the right side, come out the left side, and the back of the of the head. Now, since there have been so many sol soldiers, you know, they're shot during World War One and World War Two. there were enough of these cases around to actually observe what happens when both hemispheres get damaged. Here you have the rare case of a woman who's, who appears actually quite healthy, even though she's had some pretty bad strokes, uh, trying to do things that involve motion. So go to the course website, play a movie called Balint.mov. And Balint is the name of the uh, neurologist who first uh, observed these syndromes. And these syndromes that involve movement detection like this or bilateral spatial uh, disorder are, is referred to generally as Balint syndrome.